In a year's time, I'll turn 18 and I'll be eligible to vote for the first time. Now, most people, when they think of turning 18, may think of parties and nightclubs, but not me. After recently seeing the movie Suffragette, I became acutely aware of the long struggle women have had to gain the right to vote. In the late 1800s, the suffragettes formed a national political movement in Britain that rallied peacefully for the rights of women to vote. But they were getting nowhere and losing patience. So, by the early 1900s, Emmeline Pankhurst introduced a more radical direction for the movement, forming the Women's Social and Political Union. This union took a far more aggressive approach, adopting the motto of deeds, not words, and often using civil disobedience as a main form of their protest. The British suffragette movement sparked many similar suffragette movements around the world, and Australia was one of the first countries to give women the right to vote, the right to equality. But what about today? Let's look at the big picture. The big picture is equality for all Australians. Are we really able to say that all Australians have equality, regardless of their gender, race, religion, or sexuality? Today, I'd like to talk to you about three issues of equality in an Australian context. I will focus on gender equality, indigenous rights, and same-sex couple equality. I will then look at these issues from a global perspective and conclude with ways that we as individuals and a community can work together to increase equality and complete that big picture. So last holidays, I was canoeing in the Hawkesbury region with one of my friends who happens to be a boy. And I said to him, are you a feminist? There was silence. After a while, he replied, well, Gabby, I'm not a feminist. He seemed rather adamant. I said, well, do you believe as a woman, I should have equal rights to you as a man? And he said, yes, of course I believe that, but I'm not a feminist because feminists are women. Justin Trudeau summed it up very nicely when he said that we shouldn't be afraid of the word feminist. Men and women should use it to describe themselves. And I think he sums up this common misconception that feminism is just to do with women. And if we really want to move towards equality for women and gender equality, we need to decide that this issue, feminism, gender equality, is not just a women's issue, it's a human issue. Women in Australia have still not achieved income equality, with a gender pay gap of 18.8% and rising. Despite government legislation, such as the Workplace Gender Equality Act of 2012, women are still underrepresented in politics, senior management roles, and on corporate boardrooms. And as a woman who wants to go into business in my later life, I find the following statistic quite harrowing. Last year, out of all CEOs, only 17% were women. So while in 1902, Australia did become that second country in the world after New Zealand to give women the right to vote, it was not until 1962 that Australia's indigenous people were given the right to enrol to vote in federal elections if they wished. Unlike non-indigenous Australians, it was not made compulsory for them to enrol. Indigenous Australians are still not recognized in our constitution and they experience more disadvantage. We only have to look at life expectancy statistics to see it. 
Non-Indigenous girls born in 2010 to 12 can expect to live a decade longer than Indigenous girls born in the same year. And the gap for men is even larger. But the disadvantage does not stop there. In fact, Indigenous Australians are more likely to suffer from obesity, heart disease, and eight times more likely to suffer from abuse or neglect as children. In 2008, the Australian government pledged to address this disadvantage by aiming to close the gap in the inequity faced by Indigenous Australians. But I ask you, how can we possibly attempt to close the gap if Indigenous Australians are not even recognised in our constitution? Imagine that, the birth certificate of your nation, not even recognising the people who have inhabited the country for over 50,000 years. The government in 2017 has planned for a referendum where the Australian people will be asked if we think Indigenous Australians should be recognised in the Constitution. I think this change would be a really important symbolic step in working towards completing that big picture, but obviously it's a far way from being a reality. Considering how quickly Australia introduced its rights for women voters, it's almost incomprehensible that we are now the last country in the Western developed world to legislate for marriage equality. I have first-hand experience of the marriage equality issue in both the US and Australia. I have two mums who married in New York in 1998 in a religious ceremony before I was born and they have been fighting for equality in Australia ever since. I remember the three of us in 2011 watching history unfold before our eyes when marriage equality was introduced in New York State. Rainbow flags and pride marches filled the street. It was a day of equal recognition. And in September that year, my parents actually decided to return to New York to get married under this new state law. And my sister and I were lucky enough to accompany them for this really exciting trip. I remember the ceremony being so happy to see their relationship get that equal recognition it deserves. But it was infuriating to arrive home knowing that in our own home country, their marriage and their love would not be recognised. Repeated polling has indicated that majority of Australians, around 72%, want marriage equality. Support is an overwhelming 81% for the 18 to 24 year age group. So what's stopping it from happening? Well, back in 2004, the Howard government changed the Marriage Act to explicitly exclude same-sex couples. Before that, the law was silent on gender. Now, the issue has become a political wedge. Although the leaders of the major political parties support marriage equality, there is a small yet influential group of conservatives who are blocking the idea of a free vote by insisting upon a plebiscite. A plebiscite is a non-compulsory vote of an entire population. And there are two main things that are really not great about a plebiscite. Firstly, the people who are really against marriage equality and the people who are really supportive would come together to vote. But say it was a very sunny day and people thought, mm, I can't really get to the voting day, I think I'd rather go to the beach. So you'd lose a bulk of support. Secondly, the plebiscite would have detrimental effects on families like mine and the mental health of other LGBTI youth and people coming to terms with their sexuality. When I was in year six, I wrote to Prime Minister Julia Gillard to express my frustration at this discriminatory law. And Julia Gillard replied, she outlined the various ways that discrimination had already been eliminated against same-sex couples. And her argument came down to one proposition, that same-sex couples are equal enough. 
Now, just on a side note, after Julia Gillard stepped down from her prime ministership and also after Kevin Rudd did, they declared that they were supportive of marriage equality. And I come back to it later, but we see this lack of uh, really strong leadership on the issue, which is one of the reasons it's not going through and we're not seeing equality in our policy. So back to Julia Gillard's response of equal enough. And it doesn't fit in to the big picture of full equality. The case of marriage discrimination today in Australia mirrors that of the civil rights movement in the 1960s in America. The irrational justifications made by people trying to obstruct marriage equality here are just like the arguments used by white supremacists in their attempt to obstruct race-based civil rights. Separate but equal is not equal. It never was, and it never will be. I'd now like to take a look at these issues on a global scale and compare and contrast Australia's stance on equality with other countries around the world. So let's take my Saturday last week. I woke up in the morning and I had a driving lesson. I'm still trying to master those reverse parks. And after that, I went and played hockey. After that, I met up with a friend at Westfield Bondi Junction. We had lunch, and then I came back home via the train. Now, this day is quite a normal Saturday for an average Australian girl. However, these experiences are not possible for girls and women my age living in Saudi Arabia. Women in Saudi Arabia cannot go anywhere without a chaperone, open a bank account, drive a car, wear clothes or makeup that shows off their beauty, interact with men, go for a swim, compete freely in sport, or try on clothes when shopping. Now, that would be the real deal breaker for many Australian girls. These restrictions seem unimaginable and inconceivable to us here in Australia. It made me think if a movement like the suffragettes would ever start or gain momentum in such a country. And after a little bit of research, I found out about the hashtag women to drive campaign, rallying for the rights of women to drive in Saudi Arabia. And the campaign has made some wins. Women in Saudi Arabia have petitioned and the government has actually made recommendations to allow women to drive between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. as long as they are wearing no makeup, dressed conservatively, and have permission from a male relative. As I said, some wins. In Australia, women are obviously a lot better off. However, the struggle for equality is not over, and we really need to honour the efforts of Emmeline Pankhurst and other characters alike and work to gain that tangible equality and shatter the glass ceiling. Secondly, Australia is not unique that in the fact that around the world, Indigenous communities have faced considerable struggles to gain equality in their own nation. However, we can learn from countries such as Canada, the United States of America, and New Zealand in the policies that they are trying to implement to reduce inequality between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. It's important to note, firstly, that in all of these countries, the Indigenous populations actually have constitutional recognition, which I was discussing before. Moreover, in America, American Indians actually have a tribunal court within the judicial system of America, which allows them to govern via customary laws. And the Maori in New Zealand hold seven reserved seats in the New Zealand parliament. Now, I'm not saying that in these countries, all problems of inequality between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people have been solved, but I am suggesting that these have been positive improvements to the levels of inequality and maybe Australia could take a leaf from their book. And finally, 84% of the Republic of Ireland are Catholic. And yet, in 2015, the government held a referendum and marriage equality was passed. 
In fact, all the countries, which you can see up on the slide, have actually legalised the union of same-sex couples. And I reiterate, Australia is the last country in the Western developed world to legislate for marriage equality. And so while the battle here is building in momentum, I think we really need to focus on it and realise that the battle is far from over. So what can we do? How can we work towards completing the big picture of equality for all Australians? I think there are three main pillars which we could implement. The first is to build knowledge. We need to inform and educate our youth so they can develop a deeper understanding and be able to advocate for change on issues of equality. Secondly, I think it's really important that we take symbolic steps that demonstrate we are committed and we are working towards a tangible commitment towards equality. And finally, I think we need brave leaders who have the courage to stand up for women, for Indigenous people, for same-sex couples and for other minority groups and defend their human rights. And that is when we will see real change in our stance on equality. Australia, the job here is not done. Next year, when I exercise my right to vote, I will be looking very carefully at the policies of each political party. And I'll be looking towards a completing the big picture and parties that are prepared to do that. It's time to think big. Look at the big picture. Equality for all people. <laughs>